Energy is absolutely essential to keeping a modern society alive. What we have to understand is the grid in the U.S. is the largest machine mankind has ever built. The United States is a huge energy consumer, so we consume about 20% of the world's energy resources. This is because we are people who are immersed in energy and not paying attention. We need to start paying attention. Why waste stuff? You know, there's a pleasure in designing something better and building something better. The same pleasure is there for just not wasting. To get from where we are today to where we need to be in the future, conservation and efficiency has got to be part of the equation. Energy conservation is the idea that you're going to try and do with less, right? And so when you think about conservation, you think about avoiding using energy. An example of conservation would be, well, I just drive less, so I, I use less gasoline, or I make sure that I turn all my lights off when I leave the house. Maybe I don't need to have my heat so high in the winter, or maybe I don't need to have uh, the temperature so cool uh, in the summer, so I could sort of adjust in that way. That would be a conservation measure, right? So you're, you're making a conscious decision about how you conduct yourself in your home. It requires you to change your behavior, change your habits. And it turns out that for most of us, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. A lot of people tend to equate it to sacrifice, like they're going to be cold, they're going to have to hang out their clothes to dry, and they don't want to do that, or they have to walk to work and they live 18 miles from work, or something like that. During the Carter administration, you know, for those of us who were around at that time, there's images of Jimmy Carter in a sweater encouraging people to turn down their thermostats, to drive less, in a sense to sacrifice their comfort in order to save energy. But this was not favorably received, and over time it actually became a poster child for energy conservation. Energy conservation got a bad name. People don't want to think about that, that, that energy diet concept. They, they want to think about how to save money on their energy bills, but they don't actually want less stuff. Whereas we don't have to think about you know, being uncomfortable in our homes to use less energy. There, there are better ways. So over time, you saw a, a change really in the rhetoric and the way that this was described and people were motivated to energy efficiency. Because what energy efficiency means is doing more with what you have, or it means doing the same with less. So something's more efficient if we're able to get more, say, miles driven out of a gallon of gasoline. That would be a more efficient uh, use of, uh, of energy. Far and away, energy efficiency is the biggest source of energy that we've got. If you look at you know, the total gains that have been made through energy efficiency improvements over the last 30 years, they outweigh all of the energy that we consume from any single source today. So I think that there's a lot of good that we've been able to do. And what that tells us is that we need to keep driving forward towards making more efficiency improvements in the future. Energy efficiency standards have been placed on household appliances like refrigerators, heating and cooling systems, water heaters. Those are basically requirements that the amount of energy used to run the appliance or the piece of equipment can be no greater than a certain level. We also see them not just in electricity using appliances in our homes, but also in our automobiles in the form of fuel economy standards to lower the amount of energy we use per mile driven. When the price of oil went up dramatically in 2008, people started to buy more fuel-efficient cars, and so you know, people made that switch. So I think we do a pretty good job at it when we're given the incentive to do the good job at it. You know, the issue is when we don't necessarily have the incentive to do it. So, so I should take responsibility by buying a car that gets higher gasoline mileage. If it was important to everybody, and that was a determinant for how you buy your car, then that would package would be put into the cars because that's what would sell them. People don't talk about it as much, but when you think about where we spend most of our energy, it's oftentimes heating and cooling our buildings. We have existing housing stock all across the nation that's in pretty bad shape. They're basically just sieves. You're heating it, but the heat's going out the roof. You're cooling it, and the hot air's just coming right back in. So how do we talk people into improving their own homes? 
An important aspect of home efficiency is the insulation in your home. If you think of all the different little drafts under your doors and in your old windows, each one of those may not release a lot of heat. But if you think about all of those done together, it can make a real difference if you improve the envelope of your house and make it tighter. You'll end up with a much more energy efficient house. If I as a homeowner want to learn more about how to make my house more energy efficient, then I could employ the services of a home energy auditor. And they can do tests that actually show you know, where the leaks are in the house, as well as checking out you know, various appliances that I have and seeing where they can be updated. There's been over, particularly over the last three decades, a number of different ways that have tried to encourage further energy efficiency. One form is simply making people more aware of the energy use of their appliances, for example. So, particularly in response to the, the energy crisis of the late 1970s and, and early 1980s, there were product labeling standards put into place. These are the yellow energy guide labels that you might see on refrigerators for purchase or on air conditioners. And basically, when you go to a retail outlet or even if you buy something online, they're required to post information about the annual operating costs associated with using that particular piece of equipment. So then you can make an informed decision. Well, do I want to buy a somewhat more efficient appliance? It may cost me a little bit more, but it'll use less energy, and so therefore I could save money over time. So these product labels kind of encourage that better decision making on the part of consumers. There's another program that EPA has instituted that recognizes producers of um, energy using equipment and appliances that go beyond the minimum efficiency standards and that's a program known as Energy Star. If you've been to Home Depot recently, right, you can see on the shelves that there are some appliances that have these little Energy Star stickers or these Energy Star ratings. And basically, it's a way of being able to see, oh, if I choose this dishwasher or if I choose, you know, this stove, I'm essentially going to get the most bang for my buck and I'm reducing sort of my energy consumption. The other part of it is quite often and most often, people don't know how much they're actually paying for the power that comes out of their wall plug at any time of the day. Not understanding that the power is actually cheaper at certain parts of the day, and it's certainly often cheaper at night than it is at any time of the day. So in the age of information technology and the hardware that we have, there's vast improvements that can be made on this. So let's, let's think about smart meters for a second. So one of the promises of smart meters is that you can send electricity signals in two directions. You as a customer can potentially monitor how much electricity you're using as opposed to finding out 60 days later once you get your bill. The basic concept is that you as a consumer, you as sort of the person who owns your home, would be able to tell how you're using energy and which parts of your house you're using energy and whether or not you can sort of control that. When you think about setting your heat in your house, a smart meter can be timed so the heat goes down while you're asleep, it warms back up, it goes cool all day when you're at work and it's going to heat back up at 6 p.m. when you get home. You can program all those things into your, your smart meter at home and you never have to think about it and we could save a good deal of energy if we had that kind of control over the electric power grid. We could vastly improve the efficiency of all our buildings. We could reduce energy use by 30%, and buildings use about 50% of energy in the United States. So if you, we could improve efficiency of our entire economy by 15-20%. Uh, that's a huge step, and of course, it saves everyone money. In, in order to get these sort of significant savings, you actually want to work on all of it. We almost always start with, how can we use nature to replace something we were supplying artificially? And so we said, how can we use nature? How, we can, how can we use more natural light? How can we use more natural ventilation? How can we use the minimum of comfortable air circulation instead of having to run anything, everything through a bunch of expensive machines. I know a lot of people think, oh, this is gonna hurt people. It's gonna be more expensive or whatever. It's cheaper. I mean, that's the thing that is frustrating to some of us, that this is the wisest investment you can make. It's at once sort of one of the most promising areas for the U.S. You know, energy scene, but it's frustrating because you know if it saves money and puts everybody in a better position, why aren't we doing those things today? What has to be done is that government has to regulate standards of energy efficiency 
right across the board from cars through appliances to homes. Statistically, most Americans change their car every four years or six years. So you're not, not gonna take away people's cars. What you're gonna say is the next car you buy, there won't be any other cars to buy other than cars that are much more efficient. The most difficult problem is people's homes. You know, people don't tear down their homes very often. So what you have to try and do is to say, well, if you're installing a furnace that's gonna last 25 years, we wanna make sure you install an efficient one. You're gonna install air conditioning. That's the problem, the parts of your lifestyle which you only invest in once every 10 or 20 years. In terms of our energy future, energy efficiency is a, is a large component. And I say that because if you treat it like a virtual source of supply, really what you begin to think about is how do we make investments to make sure that it's always improving. In the same way you make investments to make sure there's enough oil and enough natural gas and enough energy in general. I think if you looked 30 years ago and saw some of the energy efficiency improvements that we've got today, people wouldn't have thought those things were technologically possible. So energy efficiency improvements go right along with the innovation process. Now, if your end objective is really literally reducing the amount of energy that you consume or reducing the amount of environmental emissions that are associated with that, energy efficiency may not be enough unless it actually yields energy consumption reductions. What is not often said, and I, so I have to stress it, is that we need both. We need to do more per unit of energy than we use, and we need to use fewer units of energy in whatever we do. So while we are becoming more efficient, we also need to use less energy and less of everything. There is an opportunity to make it part of the assumptions about being a citizen that we use less energy and that we conserve, that we turn off the lights when we're not using them. We're looking at emerging economies in Asia and other places where there are, there are millions and billions of people who are aspiring to live like we do, to live like the American middle class. And that means they will want to use energy like our American middle class do, they'll want to have cars and vehicles and comforts of home like we have. That means that demand on that global energy market is only going to continue to increase. So what we do matters. It not only matters in terms of military policy or, or moving economies or what have you. It also matters how people view us and if they all see that we are now trying to achieve cleaner lifestyles, then they're going to follow. When you think about that, um, we're sort of in a strike while the iron's hot place in terms of history right now. You know, high energy prices, consumers want more efficiency, and so we're in a position where private enterprise and government can actually work together to affect this change, and that doesn't always happen. The United States of America, with its creativity and its elasticity and its ability to harness all of these technologies, can lead the way and should lead the way again. Will we? Can we? Are we willing to do that? We haven't proven it yet. But if we're going to be a great power in the 21st century, we need to be leaders. I think we can.